We'll now back to the Australian mainland, New South Wales, far west, where we travel along the long paddock. Here's the two teams. Where I'm walking right now has for over a century been used by stockmen and drovers as a transport route for sheep and cattle and for free range grazing. This is an area known as the Long Paddock and covers over 2 million hectares throughout New South Wales and Victoria. It's an area that's ingrained itself in Australian vocabulary and a place steeped in history. You can almost hear the horse-drawn Cobb & Co coaches crunching their way along the old gravel highway. The crack of the stockman's whip and the crackle of the old drover's fire. But hey, welcome to the new millennium. Looks like our coach awaits. Covering nearly 610 kilometres along the Cobb Highway from Moama in Victoria up to Wilcannia in New South Wales, the Long Paddock is an area typified by wide open flat plains and arid landscapes. This route, while still used as a droving track, is now one of Australia's great driving tours, encompassing a whole range of activities, experiences and sights for the intrepid traveller to this region. Crossing many waterways on the journey, there is none more spectacular than this here, the Murray River. This is not just a major river, but a state border. New South Wales on one side, Victoria on the other. One classic image that comes to mind when you think of the Murray River is an old paddle steamer chugging its way downstream. In its heyday, this town of Yuchuku was the largest inland port in Australia and was even considered as a possible national capital. These days, the dream of the Murray is still alive and the town holds the largest collection of paddle steamers in the entire world. It was actually first found in 18, 1823 by Human Hovel when they crossed River to Albury, but it was first navigated some 30 years later in 1853 when a paddle steamer called the Mary Ann uh, left South Australia and came all the way up to Marama. The main cargoes was wool, weed and timber, which they used to collect from the, from the farms and the stations and bring it back to Echuca. And the reason for that was that Echuca was the nearest place to Melbourne by train. They had pushed the train line through in 1863. It is a different cargo today, it is people today. People and like us. People like you, <laughs> yourselves. Cruising along the Murray at a pace that's quite rare for today's society, it's refreshing to be able to take in all the sights, sounds and smells. You can just imagine what it would have been like for 100 years ago. Because after all, this was the main mode of transport and this, the region's only highway. This is just a different uh, form of transport. As I say, very relaxing, nice and... And you can actually hear the beat of the engine. If you listen carefully, you can hear the beat of the engine. engine. You can, that, that engine is 103 years old this year. If you go down later on and speak to it, your worry, is our engineer today? He might, he might put you to work. It's hot yeah, down indeed. there. It's hot down there, I can tell you that. It's very hot <laughs> down there. Hey, mate, you better go down here and get some wood in this fire. This old engine doesn't run on hot air, you know. All right, All right hurry up. All right. All right. Right, here we go. <laughs> Open the door. Is it hot? It's hot, all right. <laughs> we'll run out of steam soon. Oh, this is what I call a Marshall 16 nominal horsepower steam engine, which is about 100 indicated horsepower, built in 1906 in Gainsborough in England. Come out here to pump water, and then it ended up on the river and these boats. And uh, there are not too many machines that are still doing a job of work 100 years after they were built. It's a good engine. Flaming hot. It's 40 degrees out there. It'll be 45 down here, and it gets up to 50. That's why we uh, don't spend too much time down here in summer. It's an engineer has got to look after because you've got to fire it, and you've got to oil it, and you've got to uh, check the water level and check the steam pressure, and uh, a lot of little jobs. I do it in my retirement because I love the steam engines. and. Uh, I've been restoring them and running, all my, running them all my life. After having another go steering the Emmy Lou, it was time to jump back in our vehicle and head down the long paddock where we join up with the Murray again. However, this time in a slightly different style. Jumping forward 100 years, we're going to take our Murray River experience to a whole new level. Exchanging steam for sheer horsepower, we're going to get dragged behind this beast of modern day right here with none other than Brett Sands, three times world barefoot water ski champion. Let's go, man. Let's go, Tim. Let's, Let's do, do it. it. Wake skating barefoot and wakeboarding the whole lot on the Murray, mate. It's awesome. Let's go. Here a trigger is. Um, bit, bit funny like that where you've got 
you're right, the old school and the new school, you know, the, the paddle steamers kind of stick to their own little area in the port and then you just kind of meander out of there, mate, and you know, you've got 80, 100,000 dollar boats tripping down the river and stereos going, people wakeboarding, wake skating. It's awesome. But it's, I think that that's what makes the town so great. You get so many different people here and it's a great little spot to come to. It's really awesome to do it on the Murray River just because, um, it's, you know, it's nice and protected from the bank, you know, from the wind and all that stuff with the, with the trees and it's really cool. People just float down the river and pull up and chat to each other and, you know, I mean, it's like it's got its own little culture, the way the dudes talk and the clothes they wear, it's insane. Yeah, the scenery around here is fantastic. You know, you've got the flat farmlands, um, you know, not just on the backdrop of the, the big Murray River red gums, and then you've just got this river that just winds its way down, and it's just it's just awesome, you know? It's just beautiful. I wouldn't trade it for anything, mate. I don't need air conditioning. I've got it 24-7 out here. It's great. And air conditioning is something Brett certainly doesn't need. It was now time for the three times world barefoot champ to show us what he's made of. When I was young, there wasn't, you know, wake skating and wakeboarding and all that sort of stuff. So after you learned to water ski on two skis, then one ski, the next kind of cool thing to do was to barefoot. So these guys that I knew out the river, I was only a young tacker, could barefoot. And I kind of looked up to these guys and went, wow, that looks unreal. And kind of learned to barefoot and uh, become a member of the barefoot club. And it just sort of progressed from there. And after a few years, I was on the Aussie team. And way I went, mate, it was awesome representing our country. There's less margin for error when you're barefoot because the surface area is so small, so the technique's really precise. You've got to kind of make sure that you, your foot's like a little boat. You've got to have a nice little angle on it so the water passes underneath the front of your foot because you don't want it to catch because traditionally in barefooting it's called a face plant, you know, at 40 miles an hour. But if you get taught properly and you've got good technique, you know, it's quite easy. And always recommend to get someone who's done it before to teach you that, you know, a few of the guys just get out there with their mates and go hardcore and there's a bit of carnage, but it's good fun.